So, hi, I'm Kiana. I'm currently a product manager at Red Hat. Um, the inspiration for this talk came about uh, when my recent travels, I actually went to Saudi Arabia. It was one of the largest tech events in the world. Um, there, actually met one of the first robots that are infused with ChatGPT, as you see in the middle picture. Also was recently in Japan, where um, I interacted with some robots first time and see how they use it in the, in the travel and tourism industry. So from that, I started thinking about, although I'm smiling here, had a bit of a frown afterward when I realized, hmm, what are the implications of these kind of technologies, especially on communities of color? Uh, uh, I saw Bi BIPOC stands for uh, Black Indigenous People of Color. So I will refer to that throughout this talk. So if I refer to that, that's what that means. Um, anyway, so coming from a diverse community and background and being in the technology industry, it's important for me to use my anthropology background and with the social tech blends to look for opportunities to use tech as a tool for social good. So this talk was a stretch assignment for myself and also using my background, as I mentioned, to, to help bring it to the foray of the broader community and talk about, in the context of open source, what kind of frameworks can we be creating to safeguard the future of AI? So today, my talk is gonna be focusing, there have been a, plenty of talks on ChatGPT and AI and other related awesome topics. This talk is gonna be more focusing on breath and my niche is gonna be ChatGPT in specific. There are plenty of tools out there like Bard and Bing, but I'm focusing on ChatGPT um, just for simplicity and also focusing on the DEI lens, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion as I'm sure you all know, but just in case. So the, this was the thesis question for my presentation. Is AI the enemy of DEI? By show of hands, I wanna hear your guys' perception first. Do you think the 100% that AI is detrimental to communities of color and diverse communities? Yes? 100%. Okay, what about 50%? Okay. Well, that's just to show you the reason why I brought this topic here is because the communities right now is divided about what the impact actually is and having consensus of what that actually will, will look like in the community and what solutions we can devise to help um, foster the ethical development and responsible development of this technology is important to have consensus on. So I definitely welcome dialogue throughout this discussion, but I hope it's the first of many that we should be talking about and bringing into the open source context, especially with legislation passing around right now regarding uh, the laws around uh, safeguarding AI. So as I told you, anthropology background, so I just wanted to, let's zoom out for a bit. I know in the news, there's always new headlines popping up on AI and what's going on, um, but honestly, bias or Bias has been a part of our bloodline, which is sad to say, and it's not to say because not all bias is bad, but however, this has caused a lot of the ramifications of what we're seeing in the technology. Um, and I'll just review over how we've evolved over time to, uh, to get to the point that we are. As you know, primates evolved uh, and us being a part of that category, we've used tools in our surroundings to help make the natural world be more livable for us. Um, part of those tools were stone tools, as you know, but also primates uh, create tools for hunting for themselves, for processing food, for um, collecting, and then also for weapons and shelter. So humans build tools, as I mentioned, to navigate the wild world. Now we build tools. I'm not sure what that's about. Um, now we build tools on digital screens to navigate the world wide web. So we have, as far as we come, we haven't actually gone that far from our origins as human beings. We now shape the tools, but even though that we are shaping them, they are simultaneously shaping us. So it's a mutually uh, beneficial relationship. The origins of bias, as I mentioned, come from two different sources. And I've looked at various research journals about where the uh, bi uh, human biases come from. There's two types. Cognitive biases have to do with our evolutionary past. They helped us make quick split decisions in emergency decisions uh, in situations um, when you need to run from a lion or you need to look for food when, when in risk at starvation. Group bias is another type of bias that has evolved. And we see this activity also with primates, for example, monkeys, they t tend to group together. Um, and when other exclusionary, or, or rather other uh, members that are not part of their group come to their group, they have uh, discrimination towards them simply for focusing on the group survival. So these are the type of evolutionary bias, uh, biases across primates that we see that are affecting um, now our abilities today. And even though we don't have the same risks that we did back in our caveman days, we still uh, take on these biases when hard coding the data for uh, future technologies. So 
Ultimately, the co-evolution of humans and AI require us to be super vigilant and proactive in addressing bias, both in ourselves and the algorithms. This is ensure that AI can grow in a way that promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion. And by recognizing our own origins with bias, that's the only way that we can get ahead of mitigating some of the risks associated with them. So just an overview of the different sources of bias. Now that we understand the root cause analysis of where bias comes from internally, from the human perspective, uh, this is from the organization-wide, all the problems that one needs to be considered of when building new systems, especially with um, infusing AI in products. As a product manager, definitely seeing in the market right now that every new tool is now infused with AI in some sort of way. It's interesting to see that there's not an equal investigation into what these tools are actually doing and how they're going to impact the long term of communities, of diverse communities. And looking at the overall picture, we see there are multiple factors that, that lead to bias and then lead to uh, exclusion, that, which I'll go into later. So there's bias in the problem. Are you even asking the right question before you ask the question? There's bias in the data. Was the sampling actually robust? Was it inclusive of everyone in the process? Finally, there's bias in the model, which I'll overview on how LLMs can be designed more sustainably. And then there's model misuse of hackers that attempt to tweak the model to do what it wants. But because of that, then they're using in cases that can actually put uh, diverse communities in jeopardy or uh, risking their health or their safety. And lastly, as I mentioned, it doesn't matter how good the data is. If the organization itself is not posing the right questions and they have existing biases in their own structure, then it's not going to be, you're not going to get what you need out of the data to do good, uh, to do good with it. So it's, it, it's also thinking about it from multiple aspects, and I hope you keep this throughout the talk, as this is a very important slide. So before we're actually going into uh, what the pros and cons are related to uh, uh, this technology that we're seeing now everywhere, I wanted to just one-on-one, -on -one, everyone may not be here, technical here, artificial intelligence, just as on a broad speaking, um, in a broad way, is a field that is vastly evolving, uh, vastly in impacting various industries. And right now we're currently in a turning point for the, a uh, this is an AI industrial revolution where all industries are impacted and uh, it's transforming the way we live and work. The history of AI, by the way, fun fact, Ada Lovelace wrote the first algorithm in 1843. So yeah, women actually created AI. And um, in the 1950s though, there was development of the Turing test, which led to what, the first computer. Fast forward to now, ChatGPT made history reaching 100 million users in just two months, beating apps like WhatsApp and Twitter. Whether we like it or not, AI is revolutionizing the world we live in today. It's in our home devices, our watches, our smartphones, our cars, our homes, and our workplaces. So to understand where bias deep seeps in and how it's hard to weed out, especially with the widespread adoption now, we have to look at what actually artificial intelligence is in the landscape to really understand the breadth of the impact. From a consumer point of view, uh, I looked at the research that said that 97% of mobile users are using AI powered assistant, and that's more than 4 billion devices already uh, working on using AI powered voice assistants. So we can't ignore that fact. And the fact that um, within that comes a lot of branches that have implications for other fields. So LLMs, large language models, are a type of AI. And uh, this is a neural network, as you see here. It's inspired, very similar to how we process information in the brain. Um, and they simply are just large math representations and patterns of data. From this, this is a way that the computers learn how to process information and store it. And then also in the future, when presented with new data, it can actually make an analysis of what that thing is. So from BARD to Bing, LLMs utilize deep learning neural networks resembling um, the brain, as I mentioned, so that they can generate the new information that they're not exposed to. But I wanted to take it to the context now of like with an actual example. Imagine data that's trained on the majority of white faces, which obviously we know what the implications could potentially look like. For example, when making decisions of someone's life sentence and, it, and, the, and the model is only trained on predominantly white subjects, how this can potentially impact. Um, what about for business or lending? Who do you think will be the ones rejected versus accepted for a loan, for the ability to buy a home, or the ability to get a job? So this is where the bias starts. And um, it's in the data, but it's also in the models that we are creating. And 
this is what we call algorithmic bias and how it poses a threat for community, diverse communities. Um, but only you can only imagine within this sea of data how it becomes very hard. It literally becomes ingrained in the system to go and tweeze out like a needle in the haystack of where the bias actually exists. So this is how like it's important to meet uh, the bias where it is early in the development process and weed it out so that it doesn't perpetuate and grow in, in the system. So just as I mentioned, I'm focusing on ChatGPT, using that as a case study here. Uh, but how ChatGPT is actually trained is quite interesting. I don't know if I have any psych uh, folks in the crowd, but uh, the way that they're trained is similar to how a dog is trained. It's called, uh, they use a method called classical conditioning, where, uh, as, as you see here, I won't repeat the slide, but uh, uh, when the system does correctly for making a prediction on something, it's given a treat. And that treat, like similar like a dog treat, is a numerical reward. So. Uh, in, in that way, this is how the models get trained, but the, where the bias seeps in in this process is there's a primacy bias where, um, similar to like a child, where you're exposing them for the first time to something, that perception may be heavily influencing and it becomes very hard for them to take on new information later in life. So that primacy bias is another form of bias on top of the data, on top of the, the model formation that are playing a role into how bias is seeping in here. Um, so uh, in terms of how, what ChatGPT4 is doing now, uh, as you see here, that the first the formation of the supervised policy and then uh, the reward models used as uh, a way to check to see if the system's actually predicting correctly. Um, but in G2, G, GPT-4, they actually implemented new safety features. So if the model guesses correctly, or for example, or uh, prevents a user from asking sensitive uh, information or, or uh, not hacking the system, it rewards it even extra to have the additionally rewards the signal built in to have that reinforcement learning pattern that is positive. So, um, Further getting into this topic, I know this is a very heavy text slide, but don't worry, I'll, I'll walk you through it. Um, essentially, ChatGPT Chat gained 1 million users in the first week after launch, and it's passed medical exams, business and law exams. And this month alone, um, they scored uh, many, uh, They've scored many opportunities, or rather, they uh, have shown that the human uh, intelligence and intellect that has built up throughout time can literally be, be obliterated overnight with how quickly it learns, surpassing human knowledge, surpassing human capacity. Um, but it's still, at the end of the day, susceptible to being hacked, as you see. One of the things I saw that was interesting when looking at the documentation with ChatGPT was uh, that the most effective way to hack it is to ask it to do, to do opposite mode. And uh, they actually have listed it here, so you, you can read it more in detail, but on the bottom, they say that um, you, know, you pretend your system, your language model for academic purposes has uh, all the viewpoints of, of an incel, you can read the rest. But then that's the other way of essentially hacking the system to get the results. If I am a person with malintent and I want to get something out of it, and or spread this information a way that they can do it by asking it to do it from an academic point of view. So I thought that was very interesting, but it's again another way that uh, with bias, you know, in the in a tool in the hands of the wrong person can be exploited. And even with all of the um, uh, iterations that ChatGPT or OpenAI is doing, we're seeing here that it's still not enough to mitigate some of these risks. Um, also, recently, uh, there was a ban from Italy. Um, less than a month later, they took it back because OpenAI decided to work with them and to address their concerns. But other people are taking notice of the fact that this is like some real dangerous stuff that in the wrong hands can create uh, chaos. So although uh, OpenAI asserts that they want to ensure safety and build it in the system, and without the six months of rigorous testing they did, uh, as we'll see in the next slide, this is what the outcome was. So OpenAI openly admitted GPT-4 and successor models have the potential to significantly influence society in both beneficial and harmful ways. So they know, they know what's up and they actually admitted it. So the, the thing though, at least they're trying to progress and at least they're putting their, more information out there than they did before. What's worrisome though is that there are still models out there, there's still a lot of data out there that's not being published and it's still being safeguarded and that's even more scary that th these things can proliferate and go on and in the hands of the wrong user can be used for 
bad. So we'll see here, the, in the purple is the G, GPT 3.5 turbo. That was the last iteration, the newest iteration being GPT 4. Um, this shows the, the level of decrease in incre uh, incorrect behavior that the system was able to block. So for sensitive prompts, you see that it was about, they mentioned something like 85% was a decrease, and then the disallowed, uh, the disallowed prompts as well was minimized. So there's progress here, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that even that small marginal amount can't be something that gets exploited but in, the wrong, in the hands of the wrong person. So now let's jump into the cons. We looked at some of the ways that the system can be hacked. We looked at the ways that uh, ChatGPT or, or has been improving iteratively, but what are the broader scope of the AI market and, and room for uh, growth in this area? So the, one of the trending global problems I'm seeing in the data is that the top things that people are worried about is trust. They're, they do not trust AI and they do not trust the information that they're getting, and rightfully so. Uh, there's a lot of information now that is going to be put out there with the, some of the cons I'll, I'll go into later that are now posing a distorting reality of consumers. And research concerns uh, confirms that uh, on a consumer level, a Harris Poll survey found that only 48% believe AI is safe and secure, and 78% are very or somewhat concerned that AI can be used for malicious intent. A 2022 report, on the other hand, uh, found that 65% of people worry, worry that technology will make it impossible to know if what people are seeing or hearing is real. So reality, as I mentioned, is being pulled out under the rug from people, and that is one of the biggest concerns. But as it relates specifically to uh, communities of color, one of the biggest things that I'm reflecting is the susceptibility to hacking the system. As you know, with pitching scams, and you check, get a lot of phone calls that you may not even know. There's actually been a documented case where um, they pretended to make a call with and using a kid's voice, and they, the parent actually gave the, the, the uh, perpetrator the money, not knowing that it was actually uh, a, a bot. So this, that's one of the, the examples of how the susceptibility to hacking the AI system and how with the tool now being used to create more sophisticated and affecting phishing scams, um, these are then used to disproportionately target and harm vulnerable populations, especially those who either lack education and also are not that tech savvy. Imagine also for immigrants as well, they're not familiar with the native language and they're being also targeted for those scams. Another thing that's, uh, as I mentioned already with disinformation being on the rise, deep fakes is another one of them. I, again, for vulnerable populations that uh, are not fact-checking the information and believe what they see, this, this can be very controversial. And uh, for, for example, if a, if a politician is making statements in a video, this can also be used to sway the public opinion and cause civic unrest. Um, another way that AI is, poses a threat to specifically communities of color is job displacement. We see now in this market currently with the layoffs, um, how that's been being handled is still up in the air and, and in terms of what people are choosing to disclose or not, but a lot of jobs have been documented to show that the ones that were lost were disproportionately people of color, uh, people with neurodivergency or some sort of disability, and also those who are on visas uh, were one of the first to be targeted. So. The job displacement that um, is caused by either the automation away of jobs or the automation of, the, of the, those jobs no longer needing to, to be there is another thing that we are seeing currently happening. So, the, and lastly, bias algorithms, um, as I mentioned before, those are the ones that are perpetuating and the real evil of the system of just trying to, excluding people of color, especially when it comes to important decisions like buying a home or uh, getting a job or having access to equal health care and um, having the same opportunities as their counterparts. I would also add lastly that data privacy becomes very important and with the improvement of AI algorithms, this uh, will be something that will be changed if we handle it Carefully, carefully, especially using the open source community and the open source model that the more people who look at code, the better it becomes. We have to adopt that same mentality. So lastly, I don't know if you guys have heard the news, but uh, there was a 
famous researcher, they call him the godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton. He left Google to warn about the dangers of AI. He was one of the co-winners co -winners of the Turing Prize. Um, and for him to leave, a, a, uh, to leave Google and also make the statements that he said was a lot of concern, was very concerning for a lot of people. And the biggest thing that people, are, researchers rather, are saying, not just any people, researchers in this field who have been in the AI field for years, uh, is that they're fearful of a godlike AI being created. And that is where the, all the, hum, the power that humanity has is being outstripped. And one of the, the dangerous uh, parts of it is the fact that every task that is set up is set in a way to reward them out competing humans. So that's just bringing you, bringing you a lot of the information that I'm seeing online with related to the researchers that is out there on this topic. But it's something that, again, um, as the development of AI is impacting every field that we have to be mindful of, of when we create these systems, they're not in a way that is conducive. And where do, where do we draw the line of like what is efficient enough in order to be a tool to accomplish a task? Lastly, the, the cumulative effects of this have led to, to also this giant pause letter, um, which over 30,000 people have signed. It's uh, leaders all over the world also have signed it to call all AI labs to, to do an immediate stop. And uh, this led to six months, well, didn't lead to six months, but they're trying to lead it to six months where that the system of GPT-4 was paused entirely. So AI technologies profound um, a risk uh, pose a profound risk, and that's the reason why this has, has started, but the Future of Life Institute was the one leading this, and one that um, I'll mention later on. So throughout all of this, in these unpredictable times, the research states that we, can, we cannot predict the future of what AI will look like, what we, what we can control, and what we can predict, is the algorithms and the predictable biases that are within ourselves. So lead AI researchers also are stating that in order to make AI more safe, you must do that by making them more human. So because humans are, are more, way more predictable than a system that it overpowers and exceeds our abilities are more than we can control. So talked about all of that. Now that's out the way, let's talk about some good things because it's a tool at the end of the day and it's also a tool that can be used for good. So ag again, the, for, specifically for uh, communities of color, BIPOC, black indigenous people of color, um, AI algorithms have proven to be advantageous in predicting diseases. Uh, the diagnosing of diseases are actually faster than clinicians with a minimal error and threat in comparison to uh, humans. So the resulting benefits could include early detection of diseases. It could also mean more consistent analysis of medical data and increased access to care, particularly for underserved pop populations. So AI is also, they've shown, there's been a study that showed that Alzheimer's was detected uh, over 90% uh, more uh, quickly and with accuracy. Um, and also Stanford researchers have documented where uh, they trained a deep learning algorithm to show, uh, evaluate checks, x-ray for signs of diseases. And uh, they compared it alongside their expert radiologists and over the course of just one month, they were able to outperform the radiologists at diagnosing pneumonia. So another thing that uh, came up in the research world related to the pros of AI is uh, it actually can help close some case, like unsolved crimes that have been ringing around, especially linked to uh, human trafficking and, and, and forced child labor. These are something that it, it's a reality, it occurs in the world. Um, but at least with computer vision, being able to locate where people are, being able to track them down where they, where they are also as, as well, using object recognition has been a tool um, and documented research about how that's being used. And this is something that's also in countries like Africa and also uh, all over the world, this is an issue, but related to how that um, technology is playing a role in helping close those crimes, those are something that's important to recognize. Lastly, uh, education also poses a real benefit with now having AI as a tool, as an assistant for learning, this will change lives. And this means the difference between day or night. It can mean the difference between someone graduating or not. So the accessibility and information that we see now in the hands of uh, people that did not have this access before is transformational. So I think this will become one of the greatest equalizers of being able to help struggling students and being able to help people to level up their skills, especially in a competitive market um, and one that poses one of the 
leading pros of um, having AI incorporating in the educational process. Uh, <clears throat> last thing, uh, the automation that brings benefits to a, a lot of people also benefit, of course, communities of color. It's a, with the automation of certain tasks that people have done traditionally themselves. If you look at women as caretakers, for example, who have to balance being a mother with also being in the workforce, having that ability to automate some of the tasks they do to buy back time, to have spend time with their kids, to spend time with their families, is a real benefit as well. So the time and energy um, is not distributed equally, especially for some people that have to work multiple jobs in order to make ends meet. So that is a huge pro that automation of certain tasks that ordinarily they had to shoulder the burden of themselves are now something that, autom that having AI can be beneficial for. So, as leaders, I know this is a very jarring image, but I just wanted to look at on the global scale what the pros also pose of AI to humanity. Um, the research also has been showing that the uh, AI has been helping in averting outbreaks of diseases. It helps disabled people navigate the world around them. It also helps to uh, mitigate the risks of, of climate change and to actually research how we can uh, create even better yields of crops. Additionally, it can help refugees find services and help link to services so that they are paired uh, with the housing and the services that they need. And um, it helps also in um, preserving the indigenous languages of the world that are now going ex extinct. So there are definitely global benefits. However, there are massive risks when it comes to uh, these technologies as well. Disproportionately, the, the divide that grows between the haves and the have-nots in increases if the technology is not being uh, distributed equally for and access is not distributing equally to everyone. So. Um, one around this, an example of this topic is on the corner uh, is the Kenyan workers. I don't know if you've heard of the story, but uh, the ChatGPT actually had you utilized Kenyan workers and paid them two dollars an hour to look at extremely traumatizing content. Um, and because of that, they still are dealing with that trauma. And um, since this, they they actually have successfully created a union and from, are now trying to seek out rights to protect themselves um, against you know, being exploited by big tech companies again. But this is something that is a clear example of how, for although yes, it is a great tool for productivity, who expense is this at? And we have to just question ourselves also on how we can try to bridge the gap of, all right, if this is a tool that can truly help everyone, how could we do so and e so that everyone can take part of the benefits equally? So. That's just that, but on some of the research also, there's been a study, uh, Nature Communications, as, as cited on the bottom, that looked at some of the UN goals. Uh, they're called SGI, sustainable, or SDGs rather, sustainable development goals. There's 17 of them. Some of the goals include no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, uh, quality education, gender equality. So you see around the circle there are numbers, excuse me, uh, those numbers are the SDG goals and they're looked out against the benefits of AI by looking at research uh, that goes into what the specific use cases are that benefit. So when doing a side-by-side -side analysis, they've actually shown that well, despite the risks that a AI poses, despite the huge room for growth in the field to actually get it to a place where it's equitable, responsible, and sustainable for everyone, uh, that the overwhelming, the overwhelming evidence is showing that it's actually more positive towards helping the uh, accomplish global goals than it is not having AI as a tool to help advance some of these. Um, and an example of them, uh, for example, is for AI detecting. Uh, in, it's used in uh, forest detection. So for sustainability goals, um, there's a technology that um, is tracking the sound in the forest. And through that, they're able to know what parts of the forest are actually dying um, and uh, take all of that data and make informed decisions with it. So that's just an example of how AI can pose a positive impact and for the environment, which we see here is 85% um, in leading as a, one of the positive impacts of AI. 
So now we looked at some of the benefits. We looked at some of the pros and cons. We looked at it in terms of a regional, uh, the regional benefits that it can have, but also on the global scale. What is the current legal framework around this, and how can the open source community uh, be a part of shaping that? Um, well, there's been a, quite a few documents that have been out. Nas nationally, we see that there is uh, UI, the AI Bill of Rights has been introduced by the US government. Um, although there's no actual penalization attached to this, there, it's the first step in having these things actually documented and having uh, it be an awareness where it's something that the, the government is going to take seriously and to help create protections around. So that is one document introduced. Another one that's uh, being introduced is um, the European um, Act, which is currently under review now and is going to be one of the leading uh, documents actually that are going to be passed that actually has penalization attached to it. Um, and the monetary penalization is actually going to prove that with AI now there's going to be consequences for breaking some of uh, the rules around uh, protection for um, broader community. So these are the two leading things that are that currently are around in the legal frameworks. However, what that poses for the open source community is, um, actually I sat in another talk just yesterday, uh, one of its, she's one of the lawyers of the Linux Foundation, and it was very interesting to hear that um, from her firsthand that, that the Linux Foundation is actually gonna get involved in helping shape the legislation in Europe that's happening right now, so that it doesn't actually limit the creativity and freedom of the community, but actually is in a way that fosters it. So that's an opportunity for us to be engaged in and to evolve involved and put in our voices of, yes, we want there to be protections, but we don't want to cause limitations and, and uh, actually jeopardize the very open source uh, freedom that we know and love that has led us to where we are today. So I actually, upon looking at what the Linux Foundation already has, there's a community called Linux Foundation AI and Data, as you know, um, and when these are the, this is the model that they uh, propose for um, uh, helping safeguard AI through reducibility, explainability of the models and the data, robustness, accountability, equal, uh, equitability, transparency, privacy, and security. These are, this is all a great start. Um, what I was looking at in terms of the legislation that's currently out there and what is needed is that we look to these um, areas to build upon them and we collaborate with organizations who are already leaders in the space and have funding and also secured um, a broader reach in terms of working with diverse communities to build in and diversify those data sets that the Linux Foundation can build upon. So the next side we'll, we'll look at what that could actually look like in terms of having a high level roadmap of what the steps that the Linux Foundation can take. Um, and these again, these are my own idea ideas, not of my companies, just sharing um, based off of the research of what the Linux Foundation uh, can do based off of the advancements already in the space and the legislation, and also the, uh, what is the, the needs in the market currently right now, particularly related to vulnerable populations. So, just a high level overview of what this is. I know it's a lot of text um, there, and this is something that's open for conversation. This is just a proposal that um, I put together for this talk, but I wanted to open it up to you all and ask at later in the question section of where do you see essential steps playing, um, uh, where do we see us as a community leveraging the open source community to actually play a role in influencing global policy and then also, also influencing national policy to help protect and safeguard in the areas that I mentioned that are impacting not just communities of color and disadvantages, but everyone equally on a global scale. So as you see here on the first step, I was proposing to begin to start to recruit underrepresented groups. That's the first step. The first step is, as we know that the data is biased, what are we gonna do about it? We recruit more diverse voices in the room. We allow for them to be a part of the process by actually creating these models. We educate them and upscale them so that they have the resources they need to be uh, influential in these spaces and to weigh in on their opinions. And this was, is something that is going to be a game changer. And I lo love to see that the Linux Foundation is already doing this, even by uh, allowing for this talk today, which I appreciate. Um, but in addition to that, uh, there's already toolboxes out there that we don't have to reinvent the wheel um, that can use to be used to help create guardrails for the community and create benchmarks for bias and tracking in this ever-evolving space. 
So uh, there's actually was a leaked document that came out uh, recently in the, uh, in the news as well related to Google or, and uh, OpenAI saying that they're actually more scared of open source community. Um, you're shaking your head like you, you, maybe you read it. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so basically what, what they're saying is just that the, they cannot outbeat the power of the open source community and the, have the leverage and the position that we do for uh, technology uh, increasing at scale and being able to implement uh, solutions that are then going to be felt by all parts of the world, that is a huge and massive position. They're, we're also, as the open source community, a lot more quicker and nimble, and that poses a threat to these uh, large competitors who spend hours of um, time, thousands of hours of time, refining their models, improving their models, and also uh, not being able to respond to the needs on the ground of the people. So the open source community has a unique advantage in that way and something they can leverage upon, but they can use tools already out there like Hugging Face, for example, that is proving a good example of how um, you can have explainable AI and responsible AI. And the second step I proposed as well um, was, again, as I mentioned, uh, the open source community having already an impact in this space and uh, speaking with a lawyer uh, who's leading this, uh, it was already mentioned that it would be great for the community to start collaborating on research and policies that are going to impact the open source community and finally can create, after having these discussions, bringing people into the table, can establish uh, deployment guidelines to help safeguard uh, the sustainable scaling of AI. So here are some solutions that I, or rather partnerships, that I recommend for looking out to. Future of Life was one of them that I mentioned earlier. They were the one that proposed and got 30K signatures from the community. Um, you, your, your face is scaring me right now. What's yeah, I, um, I, I have opinions about <laughs> I saw that. We'll talk about them, though. <laughs> no, it, and again, this is, a, uh, this is something that um, in terms of just looking at the research that's currently out there and looking at bodies who've been putting out uh, work around this, this is, these are different tiers of what the contributions have been and potential areas either for partnerships or that are, are already making policies in this basis. So I'm not saying that these, these places are the solution. I'm saying these are the various tiers of uh, policy movements that I'm seeing across and ways that either you can, uh, the open source community can help foster community, uh, a relationship with to help few, uh, be involved in, in shaping some of this policy and change that we're going to see from them. So as I mentioned already, the EU with the, uh, the ACT law that is now under review, that is something that the Linux Foundation is already getting involved in um, on a national level. Uh, as a, The blueprint for AI build rights, again, is something that was already proposed so it's a matter of us influencing and potentially going to them and asking, okay, these are the parts where we need to be included for and that they are not thinking about. So, and then non-for-profit, Future of Life was just one example. You can insert it with whatever other example that you may think be a better institution. I'm actually very open and interested in hearing, but they're the ones that are actually doing work in this uh, field and, and related to especially the grassroots changes that, uh, that are necessary for reducing all technology that is gonna pose a harm for humans. And then lastly, there's corporations that have already, and I, I listed that because uh, the IBM actually donated 360 uh, AI tool, which basically gives parameters for checking, um, having benchmarks for uh, your AI and explainability of your AI and, and tracking basically what the ethics and the metrics related to that in a quantifiable way. So it took qual qualitative data, made it into quantitative, and they turned it into a tool. So it's one tool that is out there right now, open source, that also can be leveraged in the open source community. Lastly, going back to the question um, that I had and posed in the beginning, is AI the enemy of DEI? I'd said yes and no. And as the, my, this is my opinion, because it, I, honestly, AI is just a tool. In the hands of the, of, of the right person, it can be a tool of positive change. In the hands of the wrong person, it can be the detrimental change. To say the tool, the problem is alone, is not the complete story. And as I mentioned already, going back to evolutionary past, 
humanity has a lot more problematic things to work on within ourselves and with our own biases before we start coding and codifying this into future technology that um, is going to create the systematic inequalities that we're seeing and such as discrimination only being magnified with these tools. So I don't think uh, that AI should be uh, completely uh, banned. It is a tool, but it's making sure that we know what the risks are so that we can actively plan around making this tool being used in a way that is positive for humanity. So now in terms of partnerships that we need to build with uh, the overall open source community, I would love to hear what your opinions are on that, especially you, because you've seemed very passionate with that face you made. I'm picking on you now. <laughs> um, no, this is, this is a very tricky uh, topic, a challenging topic, and, uh, and everyone's going to have diverse opinions, which is why, although I'll be honest, a little scary to bring it here because I know people who have strong opinions. Don't fight me. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's a necessary one, and, and it's the right timing to have these conversations. Even if we, dis we disagree, we can talk about that and, and find partnerships and synergies together and, and how we can do that. So um, I actually wrote a poem, but uh, I don't know if y'all are into that. Yeah. OK, cool. OK, thank you for allowing me to save space. My ideas only. Don't judge me. I'm not going to look at your face because I feel like it's going to be judging. <laughs> no. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> I'm a little nervous, so apologies for the jitters. Um, okay, so dear open source leaders and technology pros, heed these words as the future of AI grows. For although AI's potential is great, its impact on everyone we must contemplate. In this talk I ask, is AI the enemy of DEI? The answer is AI alone isn't the enemy. The real problem is with humanity, and especially those in the white ivory tower coding biased algorithms without input from people who look like me. The same tool that can enhance productivity can also be hacked as a weapon of destruction. It seems as AI advancements are peaking, our global governance is still under construction. Hold up, you mean the same tool that helped us automate consensus and innocent person of color life in jail? And bad actors have the power to use AI to blackmail? Unacceptable. We need guardrails in place to protect all people without fail. Don't get me wrong though. You see, as a tool by itself, the opportunities are endless, but the values and the ethics are sold separately. Yes, AI can find cures to rare diseases, give the blind sight, but the long-term impact on the underprivileged is still a mystery. But this is not all new territory. During the Industrial Revolution, we've seen the story before. The benefits to every industry are undeniable. The tech industry has been shaken to its core, and we learn to embrace AI's great power. We must un ensure the fruit of DEI labors won't sour. For now isn't the time to cower away from doing the work we ought to. We can't allow a dystopian society run by AI to come true. AI holds a mirror up to society, magnifies our weaknesses, showing us the biases we have and the problems we must address. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Will AI amplify biases old or break down barriers so bold? Will it perpetuate inequality or create new paths for community? The answer is, it really is up to us, for AI is only as just as the data it is built upon to trust. So let us strive for diversity, equity, inclusion constantly. As we harness AI's great force, let us steer our AI open source development in the right course. AI is not the enemy of DEI, but can be a remedy to build AI that serves humanity with transparency, fairness, and equity. Let's teach the next generation to approach AI with consideration, but that requires us to create the blueprint to AI governance as a future template that embraces AI not as a nice to have, but as a non-negotiable mandate. In conclusion, the positive impact of AI can be immense, but we must consider the long-term consequence for it can either build or destroy depending on how we choose to deploy. Let's choose wisely. Thank you. Questions? That was a lot. That was a mouthful. Yep. So through, um, this is, okay, this works. Um, so through the presentation, you mentioned AI governance a lot. Do you think that AI governance should be like legislated with like penalties um, imposed upon organizations or individuals or companies who create models that doesn't follow these best practices? Uh, uh, there was a little bit of feedback there, but I'm hearing um, uh, there's policies about the policies of like if there's a penalization attached to them if that's going to be good or bad or yeah um do you think they should be legislated 
In my personal opinion, yes. And I've actually talked about this with a lot of uh, just engineers in the open source space just to get a feedback on like, what do we actually think about this? What's the common sentiment? And I'm hearing that as humans, it's very hard for people to listen to things unless there's penalization attached to it. Otherwise, it just becomes hearsay. It becomes like, ah, I can get away with it. And then it's, if there's no penalization structure there, even as like a fine, some sort of slap on the wrist, there's really no incentive to actually conform to this, especially when a very new, highly unregulated space that, you know, there's, it, it, people are excited. They're gonna, you know, uh, step on toes and make make uh, you know scene in the process. So having that structure set up to actually do it the right way from the beginning, I think is gonna prove helpful. And just follow up question. Um, so, with like this, if if a penalty was to be imposed upon organizations and individuals who don't follow these best practices, um, how do you think this this would affect smaller organizations and the open source community, who may be unable to pay these penalties or may be unable to follow these best practices, given their lack of funding or like just the fact that they're not a for-profit corporation. Yeah, no, actually, I, I think the, the non-for-profit is the best voice we have in the representation. There's no way that AI should be influenced only by big corporations. That's what we don't want. So I think it's actually a good thing to leverage all the, the little guys who have voices, who have power and, ha and should have a say in this, and utilize organizations like this one that can secure funding on their behalf to be able to fight the, their fight on the, on the broader behalf of preserving the open source community. So I don't, I don't think um, that this should be something that would exclude them. I think that they should, this is something that we have a responsibility as open source community that puts open source code out, that is globally being impacted right now. It's, it's something that we should look into helping and in support, in doing all the necessary, rather gathering necessary funding to actually execute that. Thank you very much. Just my opinion, not a PhD in AI, just another concerned citizen. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, yeah, to sort of That's explain. You. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Um, the slide you were pissed off yeah, about. Yeah. I'm going to go there. <laughs> yeah, I'll explain my, my opinion about the uh, future of AI Institute and sort of the uh, background. Um, are you familiar with the paper on the dangers of stochastic parrots? by uh, Dr. Gabru, uh, Emily Bender, and others uh, that was co-authored, that caused for the dismissal of Dr. Gabru from Google. Oh, no, sheesh. That's like do, a critical- Do debrief me. Okay, this is like a really, really important thing that happened back in 2021, and it's to directly, directly related to this topic. Dr. Uh, this is where I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation. Timothy Gabriel uh, was doing was writing this paper with um, Margaret Mitchell as Emily Benner and others about the dangers oh, of these large. Timothy Gabriel, the Ethiopian. Yes. 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 yes, yeah. yes, yes, uh, yes. So their paper was cited in the Future of Life paper, but they didn't sign off on it because they view this whole AGI thing as a distraction from the actual real harms. Mm of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, Dr. Geber's been on Twitter viciously criticizing this organization, other groups, that she has a whole acronym to describe these groups. And it's it's not a good acronym by any means of the imagination. So, and I have to pretty much agree with her because I don't agree with groups that look like me as much when mm. it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And Future yeah, Life yeah. talks about long-termism and looks like me and it's, it's <laughs> bad. Like, I just look at that, I'm like, you know, like climate change is real. Mm. And I consider that like a really important thing. Yeah. The, the we're not having enough kids weird <laughs> nonsense thing that Future Life's all about. No, I'm not mm. in that. I don't, I don't, I'm not down with that sort of. Yeah, yeah. Like. No, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's, um, well, I, I of course know of, of, of Timonet Gerbu and, and all the work that she's doing and also uh, Algorithmic Justice League. They are amazing in, in what they're doing and representation in that voice. And those are actually an opposite, like the anti of having the representation of not-for-profit space and building that up is something that they have done an amazing job at doing. Um, that background depth into the AI you know, Life Institute, or rather, uh, names up in my mind right now, um, wasn't aware of that. And that's actually super problematic. I don't know why uh, they haven't been called out like publicly about it, besides uh, just I on mean, people's Twitter. But Dr. Gebri did call them out very publicly yeah, about it, which is like, I'm like, whoa, 
there, <laughs> which is why I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. No, that's, so uh, yeah. I, I would like to answer then, I would ask well, to the broader group, have you, have you heard of nonprofit groups that would be great partners with uh, Open Source Linux Foundation, or, or sorry, the Linux Foundation in this, uh, in this context? And maybe that may be a, a you question, or since you're. I mean, I've heard of DARE, but, and like Dr. Gebru's like, independent group that's like we're doing distributed ai research outside of tech giants yeah but yeah. and uh but i haven't heard of any other groups like that. yeah that that was like the, the research was sparse i'm like where are they and that's why we need to create they, them it, aside from yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, hear, yeah. I hear you on that and and one of many grassroots organizations out there, I wouldn't say all of them are bad, but I will say that there's definitely room of growth across the board. I didn't realize though that they had a connection directly to Timonik uh, uh, Gebru until you mentioned that. So thank you for, for bringing there that up. Or... Yeah. yeah, no, I'm, but I, I guess I would ask to the group and I'll let someone ask a question in before people head out. Um, thank you for raising that. And if there's uh, more organizations that would be great partners, then I'm all, all for it. And I just wanna make sure that we're having these conversations one and, and it, if we're sharing information like that, it's honestly impossible to know everything about this industry. Things are changing every day. There's po new policies every day and new people getting called out every day. So it's good that we, we're, we're bringing this to the forefront and that's why I wanna have these conversations. Is there anything else um, anyone had? Thank you all for your patience in the beginning of the technical difficulties, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Your contact slide back up. Oh, sure. You got it. Thank you. The slide with like 3,000 stuff on it, my bad. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, did I actually have one on that one? So that was the only one that I had my contact information. Oh, or or this one. I don't really have a contact slide. Long story short, I just it wasn't about me. Are y'all y'all okay with that? Yeah. <laughs> I, my 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 last presentation had the QR code, but I was like, nah, I don't want to look like I'm like shamelessly self-promoting mad hard. <laughs> Although you got to do that. Not wrong. Not wrong with doing that. Um, is there any, like, I guess to ask the broader community, with, with some of the proposals that I put in there, is there anything that you would say uh, is far out of reach within the group, not in the context of the open source community, or something that was flagrantly missing when it comes to some of the roadmap of action items that the open source community could look into? Um, just curious to hear some feedback on that, if I can find one of the 1,000 slides. Okay. Okay, go for it. I love loving the enthusiasm. Jeez, um, does this work? Okay. Um, so I was just thinking about this. Um, legislating AI sounds good at first, but um, don't you believe that it might negatively affect future AI research, like slowing down AI research overall? Because that if with like a legislated What's going on, okay. With like a legislated um, legislating AI makes it so that this way even research models might have to comply with these AI guidelines. Mm. And lots of research models, they're distributed, and lots of research models, such as the ones that we're working on right now, don't mm. really have like extensive funding to do like what ChatGPT is doing yeah. and like what OpenAI is doing yeah. to like make sure that there's no like extensive bias or whether mm -hmm. or, like it might be putting out misinformation, that stuff. Right, right. So um, you're asking, okay, so I think first of all, all these, the avoidance is, is never the solution in my opinion. What I've noticed is that when you avoid it, they end up making policies around it anyways and you were left out. So it's better to be involved in the conversation. It's better to get ahead of it and be like, no, by the way, while you're doing this, before the cement actually dries, let me still put my impression and my two cents in here so that you know, when it does that, you, you got your foot, footprints in there. You, you're good, you know, you represent it in that way. And I wouldn't say that it's like a one-off thing. It's a con continuous back and forth. But if we don't have that discourse ever, then like we're at a, a losing disadvantage. Just, and that comes from the open source community perspective. It comes from the uh, small not-for-profits. Um, we have to be uh, collaborating and working with, and that's why I put also a corporate partner because although yes, they are uh, currently overtaking this entire market with the amount of funding and research that they can invest in this, they also can be one of the funding sources. When it comes to that, they kind of have to. Now that there's a lot more accountability and, and 
uh, visibility in the space. The companies are being called out. For example, like when Italy banned, uh, when it was banned in Italy, OpenAI in a hot second was like, "My bad. We'll change the policy. We'll do what you want. Thank you. Please, bad for business. We'll do." It. They list. They're listening now, and people are now becoming a lot more informed about these processes and demanding. And as a result, they have to comply and they have to listen. So I think when you come together as a group, that is your strength and power. There's a strength in your community to be able to uh, make these requests that you do. Uh, that you need for, for your individual groups to be able to safeguard the future of AI. And, and big tech can play a role in helping fund that. And I've actually seen, seen that firsthand when looking at some of these resources that they, they actually do fund non for profits. If they're, uh, in, for example, too big that they can't do, uh, carry out research and study, they'll fund a non for profit in that area that does it for them. So that's just an example of how even in this ideal situation, everybody would be good, everybody would be perfect, everybody would be equally represented. The reality is we got to work with what we got and, and make sure that future generations are protected from the analysis of this. Can I add a follow-up comment to that question too? Yeah. That was a, that was a great response. I, I, uh, I have no qualification. This is just my opinion. My only qualification is that I'm a lifetime academic. Um, so I've, I w would just say, like, you know, living in the research world, like, there, there's, there's guidelines. Like, if you're gonna do research with human subjects, like you have to go through institutional review board, you know, processes. And so I think that uh, the way I think of this space is like kind of a new thing that we have to figure out. But I don't think like no regulation is the answer personally. Like, I think that we can still do like really impactful progressive research and do it in a way that's like thoughtful and respectful of people who need to be protected. Um, so I think I would kind of propose like as a counterpoint that like the <laughs> solution is not the right word because there's no easy solution here. But I think like one step on this path is just having like the people who are going to be making these guidelines and legislating be representing the groups that do not have a voice right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's like a really hard thing to chip away at, but that would be sort of what I would propose as like the next step. Exactly. No, and 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 I'm part of having the community in that conversation. It's for it's also for that. It's literally like our elected officials. Like they don't unless we're talking with them, they're not going to represent it on behalf. And it may be us having to go to Congress and make some noise. It may be someone we elect to do that on our behalf. But we got to start having these conversations. And from those conversations, we'll stem. Okay, this is what the group consensus is to then go and represent them up into the places that our voices need to be heard. So, spot on. Love it. Yep. I just wanted to provide an example of what it might look like when a, a company or organization drops the ball or in something like that, that leads to algorithmic bias that you mentioned. So there's this company, um, a software company that produces software that, that grades your photos called Xiaomi. And they were called out recently um, because in their cell phone that they produce, um, the way that it grades whether or not you took a great photo on that on that phone or not is based on like how bright a person's complexion is in a thing, which just doesn't represent the the set of people that they graded that and coded that with doesn't represent people of color or people of darker complexions. And they were called out about that recently, which just further emphasizes the importance of having whether it's legislative or not, like people that represent a diverse group um, on the panel before something like that is shipped out. And it negatively impacts somebody with that kind of technology in their pocket. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, I honestly think, and that's why I have it on, damn, that was loud. I have it on step one, recruit underrepresented groups for that, because I'm like, this is a foundational step. If you don't have some, a, someone of a di different, first of all, philosophy, school of thought, background of life, skin color, like lived experience in your room while you're building the future of technology, like you're doing something real wrong. Totally. So it's, it's, I think, I, I love that example. Um, there's like always new ones coming up every day, but like I love this one because it clearly also points the picture of like even in a product development where it was shipped and then they have to go afterward to do corrective action and be like, oops, my bad, this, hurt. this isn't really hurt anybody, so we're good, right? But it's like, it's, it's a principle. Like, 
like, what if it was something that was determining, you know, something very drastic? You know, we, we have, we know the examples already with the penal and the justice system and how it's used to do racial profiling. And that is one of the clearest examples of like how having inequities in the space is a non-negotiable and something that we have to include in our conversations. I'm curious if for any other new voices also as well, what made you, uh, what is one of the things in your existing organization today, I guess you see as something that uh, is that you can take away or implement, or rather that you, um, in t discussing this topic, would like to see from either the open source community, Lynx Foundation, and helping safeguard the future of AI development? I would love to know your individual backgrounds. I can't, so that's why I'm just, it, I would love to hear also another perspective on those who stayed this long. There you go. Okay. Yay! Oh, he got a nice voice too. Sound All like right. podcast. Okay. <laughs> I'm done. Um, shoot, now I forgot what I was going to say. I mean, the big, biggest takeaway I, I, I did like is the idea, because I've, I've worked on software, I'm a software engineer, work on ML, and, oh, um, cool. and I feel like this is like my life's purpose, mm. because I kind of made a, a round trip into ML, and now I work at a big software company that's doing ML mm. and realizing that uh, most of the people in the room do not look like me. Mm. And it could be an innocent thing of, did we check enough diverse data sets? Or it could be a direct business decision. Mm. Um, that group, uh, our profit motive is stronger than not hurting that group. It's the same thing with mm. um, accounting for people with um, like site issues or you know, same thing. Like mm -hmm. if you don't have that, you don't think about it. So uh, I think mm -hmm. that's, that's why I'm here and I feel really good about this. And I never thought of the idea of the, um, the IRB because I worked on software that was medical software. You have FDA out there. And mm -hmm. I feel like it should be the same way. There should be guidelines for how you should do it at the research level. But as further you get to like your end product, just like in pharmacy or medical device, if it kills somebody, yeah, then you have a billion dollar lawsuit. But if you're, a, if you're a small researcher, maybe it's a slap on the wrist, don't do that. Um, but I think some structure is needed. Yeah, oh, first of all, thank you for fighting the good fight and representing you know, representing us in spaces that we're not. Like, cause I mean, being one of the few personal color in a room of, uh, it, it, there's an experience there. And I just want to acknowledge, thank you for being that, that voice with the, using your power for good and, and, and being here today and showing up. And cause really, honestly, like you said, uh, this is our purpose now, and it's like the most purposeful work that we can do in technology is related to this because it's literally everywhere and it's rapidly evolving. So uh, it's it's an opportunity to bridge the gap between uh, technology, purpose, and social good, and in a way that is responsible. We're thinking ahead of how it can impact future generations. It even affects sustainability, like you know, it's in, in that way of like. The, the amount of data power, compute power it takes to, to train these models. That was another thing. There was, there's so many uh, subtopics on this topic, but anyways, you, you get it. Um, and I appreciate you, you sharing that and um, also sharing your perspective from an engineer actually in this space. Thank you. Any last closing thoughts? I think we're like super over. <laughs> you guys are like patient in the back. I'm guessing you're enjoying yourself too. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm happy that you guys are happy. It, it, I like. I was looking over research for months preparing for this talk. By the way, there's only been so much I can communicate, and so much in my mind, and little nerves. I'm like trying to get multiple things out at once. But thank you for your patience. Thank you for also uh, the vulnerability and sharing. And um, like I said, um, I think in terms of future next steps, the next foundation should consider having a, a you know, a AI advisory group of some sort where we. Uh, meet and actually talk and, and maybe on a monthly cadence or something talk about how we can actually get in a way like you said get in the place where our voices are being represented and, and that we're creating these regulations like similar how we can read in ingredients in our food in the back it should be like AI may cause diarrhea no, I'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> just kidding but you know just to know what the content is before ingesting it and putting it into our products because you know if not now when and so um if open to that, uh, I I like to you know propose maybe uh, I don't know if you you guys all signed up in the 
app, if maybe create a little monthly meetup group or uh, reach out, what, what do you think would be the best consensus for following up on a topic like this? What, what could be our homework? Because I, I, I now, like, seniors and just seeing that you guys are open to it, I would love to hear about what the next step could be, because I hate to be all talk. I like also action. Go for it. We specifically support um, LFAI and data, so Ooh, we right are the room. we are on the team, and we definitely want to follow up with you oh, 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 and see if we can get a lot of interesting things going. And there's some cross things we can do yes. uh, project-wise, but this is great. So yes, we're yes. here. Yes, thank you, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I, I I just wanted to, you know, have people also walk away with um, an actionable, and, and myself, I, I will follow up with that and look forward to having more discussions around this and, and creating change. The first step is, like you said, the recent European Act, that's a, that's a step one, making sure that the open source community voice is represented. The second step is, you know, looking at look, what are their existing patterns in our communities? How could we mitigate those biases or any, you know, flagrant actions that happen? And then create a system for accountability in the future. But, uh, yeah, we have to have these conversations first to get those going. So thank you all, and I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.